This video is brought to you by Brilliant. Walking along the Chicago River during the warmer months is a pretty amazing experience. There are all kinds of activities that you can participate in or just observe while you stroll. You can run, <laughs> you can take a boat ride, you can sit down and have a bite to eat or drink, you can relax on the Strand or soak in the views of the buildings across the way. But as soon as dusk arrives, something pretty remarkable happens. If you're standing here or anywhere where you can see this building in the background, you'll be treated to a dazzling display of animated digital art as the building is drenched in light from the projections from across the river. The installation is called Art on the Mart, and it's the largest permanent digital art display in the world. And in this video, we're going to explore how this installation works to transform the city and some of its architecture, from static constructions of stone and concrete into a digitized display of bright, colorful, and ever-changing spectacle. Public art is an important part of any city, but Chicago seems to really understand the role that art plays in creating vibrant urban spaces. Around the city, you have examples like the Flamingo by Alexander Calder that you can walk around and under. From every angle, it creates an amazing contrast against the dark and rigid buildings by Mies van der Rohe in Federal Plaza. Or other examples too, like the steel Pablo Picasso sculpture that people can climb on. Or the Standing Beast, which was intended to accept an ever-changing layer of graffiti, a plan that didn't ultimately realize. But more recently, you have the Cloud Gate, which reflects the city around, or Crown Fountain, which puts Chicagoans' faces in the place that you would more typically be reserved for commemorative historical figures. But even within this robust heritage, Art on the Mart distinguishes itself by being particularly unique and powerful. If you think about it, those other examples of public art, they're all physical objects placed in the middle of public spaces. These objects become the center of focus, and in a way get in the way of interacting with other people inside of a plaza. Art on the Mart, on the other hand, is a projection into the edge of a public space. It takes up almost no physical space whatsoever, while creating a powerful impact and catalyst for activation. The orientation, I think, of many Chicagoans was toward Lake Michigan. And now with the advent of the Riverwalk, which the Art on the Mart installations active, activate, essentially, um, Chicagoans have this second point of orientation around this other body of water, around the Chicago River. This is made possible by using an existing building as a projection screen and the surface that accepts the artistic interpretation and expression. Um, the idea is that through sight and sound, in, in, in a certain sense, people are transformed for, for some moments um, and, and taken inside this, this experience. But this building is no neutral background like other projection screens that you might find in a movie theater. The building is the Merchandise Mart, and when it was built, it was the largest building in the world. It has always been a grand spectacle. The building is made from 29 million bricks, it has around 4,000 windows, 30 elevators, and around 7.5 miles of hallway. Just the facade of the building facing the river alone is more than 2.5 acres of vertically oriented real estate. The building's significance goes well beyond its sheer size, though. It opened in 1930 and was designed by Graham Anderson Probst and White. They were the successor firm of Burnham and Root after the passing of the partners. Daniel Burnham was the architect responsible for the hugely significant 1909 plan for Chicago. And there is perhaps no single person or practice that is more responsible for the evolution or the design of the city. One of the important contributions of the 1909 plan was recognizing and celebrating the value of the Chicago River. The plan included important design and policy decisions that filled the river with activity and framed it as a special feature and public amenity. Even though at the time, the reality of the river was far from bucolic. It was more like a sewage dump for the factories and manufacturing that lined its banks. At the time, it was considered commercial infrastructure, not something to protect as a natural resource. This area, called the Confluence, where the river branches into the north and the south branch, was an important node in the Burnham scheme. In some ways, though, this area has always been a significant site. It was even the location of the first trading post here in Chicago. And since then, it's continuously been a vital area for exchange. Drawings of Burnham's 1909 plan shows gondolas and other boats passing through, in, and around a rather ceremonial overlook plaza. 
This plan demonstrated how beautiful the river could be, and it was instrumental in the decision to remove a train yard that sat on this site. This paved the way for the Merchandise Mart to become its own important place of exchange and do its part in making the riverfront a more pleasant place to be. Historically, the building was the home to all the architectural and interior design vendors for the region, making it an endless interior of interiors. But recently, it has begun to serve as host to new methods for exchange. The function of the interior space of the Mart has changed over the years. Um, and currently it's home to not only design showrooms for which it's most famous, but also Fortune 500 companies uh, and, and some technology-based centers such as 1871. And so inside the Mart, it's truly uh, a center of art, design, and technology. And art on the Mart is the exterior representation of, of that nexus. The building commemorates its role in history with medallions and sculptures that reference Chicago's early trade activities. Of course, all this makes the building a good candidate to highlight even further with artistic projections. But all this ornament and deeply recessed windows also presents a technical challenge to project on too. They digitally mapped the facade to compensate for these disruptions. The projection strategy required precise control of where light goes and where it doesn't, so people inside wouldn't get blinded by the projection blasting through the windows. It's also important to consider the material of the facade, which is limestone. And the limestone is a, a key uh, protagonist in the video mapping projects because of the way that it absorbs light and color in such a unique way. And so that's something that we've learned over time. And in a, in a sense, we've developed kind of recipes of, of which, light, <laughs> which light colors to mix to achieve just that red that an artist wants. All this is managed from a booth located from across the river. If you aren't looking for it, you might miss it. It was designed by the firm Valerio Dewalt Train, and it's so small that every single inch inside the interior space had to be designed perfectly to hold the equipment in place and keep it all within the ideal operating conditions. They designed it in a very um, special space. We actually um, it, it took space that's underneath Upper Wacker Drive, but above the river walk, and so it was just really the space above our heads as if as we're standing on the river walk. And that was essential because it's important to remember that the river walk is public land. Up there are 34 projectors, each weighing 300 pounds and taking up about the same space as a carry-on suitcase. For context, the power of a projector is measured in a unit called lumen, which is a measure of the total quantity of visible light emitted by a source per unit of time. A typical projector emits maybe two to 3,000 lumens. Each projector for Art on the Mart produces 30,000 lumens. That's about 10 times the intensity of something that you might find in a home or a classroom. They're bright enough to shoot an image across the river that's 80 feet by 80 feet in size. The pattern of the projectors overlap and they coordinate perfectly with redundancy so that if any one of the projector fails, no one would ever notice. The booth also has enough space for maintenance personnel to check on things every once in a while. And each projector has its own exhaust system to carry the hot air from the bulb and the electronics so that it can be blown out the back of the building onto lower whacker behind it. The projectors also have to shine through a layer of glass that keeps out the elements and protects them from damage. Normal glass has a green hue that is the result of iron impurities. That's why glass often looks dark green or blue on its edge. But the glass here is a special low iron glass, making it as clear as possible. All of this operates behind the scenes to create a seamless and effortless animated display that engulfs the merchandise mart in art that is different from traditional public art. For one thing, it operates more like an outdoor gallery than like a traditional sculptural painting. One of the biggest challenges and opportunities for artists is to understand that this is not simply a flat 2D screen in the way a computer screen functions. While it has a, a certain 2D quality to it, it also has incredible architectural detail. Also, the surface geometry of the facade is not simply a rectangle. The display is continuously curated by the Art on the Mart team. This means a few things. Firstly, the art on display can be more bold or experimental than would otherwise be possible. If something doesn't work, it can be easily changed. Also, it can remain topical and contemporary. Because it's a, a platform that is site-specific, 
It relies on uh, time-based media. It can be responsive to the changing and most relevant issues of our time. What's so powerful about this platform is clearly its scale, its location, its ability to amplify the voices of the broadest range of artists. And uh, that's what we need in our time, is to, to hear from many different people. While there exists other large outdoor displays, and they might be associated with other kinds of places like Times Square or Las Vegas, Art on the Mart is limited to only the display of art. It is a result of a 30-year agreement with the city of Chicago and will never display branding or sponsorships. All this leads up to making the installation the largest and longest running digital art project in the world. At a conceptual level, the projections transform the building because as a historic work of architecture, the projections create a new narrative to create a kind of relevance and also some clarification in a way for our times. Brilliant has generously supported this video and I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I got started using Brilliant in my spare time to brush up on some skills and knowledge that I've regrettably let lapse over the years. And you can too for 20% off using the link brilliant.org slash Stuart Hicks. Brilliant is a learning experience that teaches and challenges you with progressive and interactive programs, puzzles, and different kinds of exchanges that make learning feel like entertainment. And look, I am generally not a puzzler at all. I don't have any games on my phone, not a single one. I'm not sure why, but I just never really got into any. But instead, maybe what I'll do is I'll start a lesson with Brilliant on my computer, maybe on lunch break, and then pick up where I left off on my phone while I'm waiting somewhere else. I've been working my way through their logic series that uses robot characters that I've grown somewhat attached to. They keep racing and misreporting their findings. Along the way, I found that I've uh, definitely needed some help to solve a puzzle or two, and Brilliant is super easy to navigate, and it's really accepting of my inability to solve some of the puzzles, and I found myself thinking more clearly and deeply throughout the day. But Brilliant has lessons for everyone. You don't have to be like me in any way, or like an architecture professor or anything like that. There are life-applicable topics to match your curiosity, and Brilliant offers a community to help inspire and keep you excited about learning. So, I've worked a deal out where the first 200 people to click on the link in the description, brilliant.org slash Stuart Hicks, will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. So get started playing and learning with Brilliant today. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribe to the channel. It's a great way to show support and ensure that we can make content like this. Videos come out on Thursdays, and while you're waiting, check out some of these other ones. See you over there.